Serverless sucks and monoliths are back in style. That's what social media would have you believe lately. And it's all based on this article, the one that I have in front of you here. Uh, it's an article by the Prime Video Tech Team and the title is Scaling Up the Prime Video Audio Video Monitoring Service and Reducing Costs by 90%. By 90%, that's a pretty bold claim. So naturally you'd wanna know like how do they do this? And it turns out that they used a serverless approach for this and it ended up being super, super expensive and they switched to a monolith and now everyone is saying, hey, look, I told you, monoliths are the way to go. Serverless sucks, you should never use them. So that's what, what's been going on in the internet recently and it's completely overblown. I like to think that the people that are kind of touting this and spreading it haven't actually read the article and haven't really done a lot of critical thinking into what they are actually saying here and some of the different approaches that they took. And so what I want to do in this video is kind of take apart and dissect the article and explain to you kind of what was going on in it and why a lot of their decisions actually made sense and why a lot of the claims that you may hear about online on Twitter and, and the Reddits and all that are completely overblown. So in terms of the approach for this video, um, monolith is serverless and back again. Um, just kidding. Uh, I want to first talk about the problem, just kind of like a general domain of what they were trying to solve. Then we're going to talk about their initial solution. So how how they approached it, some of the scaling bottlenecks that they ran into and the cost bottlenecks. Then I want to talk about their approach to the re-architecture and how it achieved those cost savings by going back to what they're calling a monolith. And that's honestly, spoiler alert, that's kind of why people are mad about this. But anyways, we'll get back, get to that later. And then four, uh, why the internet is mad and why people are freaking out and why people are saying like serverless sucks and all that. So that is the subject matter for this video. So let's just jump into it. And first I wanna talk about the problem. And by the way, I will leave a link to the article down in the description section of this video. Prime Video Tech Blog has a lot of great stuff, so highly suggest you check it out. Um, and yeah, the description will be the article will be in the description. All right. So first things first, let's talk about the problem. And give me my pen here, please. How do I get that? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So problem, right? So we are talking about Prime Video, all right? And Prime Video, if you don't know anything about it, I like to think most of you probably do, is that it's a service as part of your Prime membership, you get to watch live TV channels, okay? Live TV streams, channels, whatever you wanna call them. And so uh, imagine here that you have a, a channel, right? This is a channel, maybe it's like, I don't know, Fox. That's like the first one that comes to mind or like CNN or whatever. And you have many, many channels that are offered through Prime Video, like lots of different live sports and stuff. So maybe this is like, I don't know, CNN or ESPN or whatever. Anyways, uh, what the team, I believe they call themselves like the video analysis team or something like that. What their job was is monitoring this stream, these streams, all the streams or all the channels for quality, quality. And so they were interested in whenever there were kind of degradations in the quality. So anytime that you're watching a video online, it comes down in chunks and there can be kind of corruption in the data or misalignment between the audio and video. Sometimes you'll see like artifacts on your stream, like little pixels and blobs here and there. So their goal as part of this team was to monitor each independent stream constantly around the clock to make sure that it didn't have any quality degradation, right? And just for clarity's sake, when we're talking about each stream here, we're not talking about each independent customer, like you as an independent customer, like you and me, like maybe there's like lots of us over here or whatever. Um, we as a group like hook into this feed. Okay. So if there's a bad feed for Fox news, we'll all experience it. Right. So there's only one, one live feed that's happening as part of the channel. And every single person that's a, an audience member is getting the same feed of that channel. Okay. So if there's a degradation in the quality of the stream on prime video side, there's going to be a degradation for everyone. So that's the idea. It's not at the customer level. It's at the channel level. And I actually looked it up and there's something like a hundred plus channels on prime video. So quite a few, and they wanted to build a tool that was automated, had alarming, all that kind of cool stuff that would basically let them know whenever there was any quality degradation so that they can kind of solve it. Okay. So this is a little bit of context for the problem. Now let's talk about um, their initial architecture, their initial solution. Okay. So um, initial, initial solution, solution. Okay, so there is a stream and I'm just drawing one channel out here and just bear with me. There's many, many different channels, obviously, but let's just make it easy and just talk about one at a time. 
So what they decided to do was they decided to leverage a tool and this the tool essentially worked like this. It would break down each stream. By the way, this is time. So time is going to the right, okay? And so they would take this stream and they would analyze it in one second chunks. So that's one second, this is another one second, this is another one second, this is another one second, right? So for every one second that expires, they would analyze all the content in terms of the audio and the video that took place in that one second interval. So over 60 seconds, there'd be 60 different chunks of audio and video to analyze, pretty, pretty clear, and multiplied by many different channels, of course. And so the approach that they used to do this relied on serverless technologies. So the primary one was uh, through a step function, right? So they had a step function, and let me actually just get a different color here if I can. Do I have like red? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so they had a step function that on every one second interval for every stream here, uh, what they would do is that they would launch this step function. So like this would go here. And so they had a Lambda that, that basically did a little bit of work here that kind of parsed the input. And then from there, they launched what are called detectors. And detectors are, they're these things that use ML algorithms based on their descriptions, and they analyze the content. And they're all focused on different things. Like detector A will look at something. Detector B will look at something else. Detector C will look at other things. And there were many, many different detectors that they had in their, their system here, right? So that's the idea. So this initial lambda would kind of branch off into two different directions. So that would go left and right. It would call detector one, detector, detector one, detector two, detector two. So it would launch these in parallel and then it would collect the results in another Lambda function, right? Lambda function. And then when it's done, it would write this stuff to S3, whether or not there was kind of any aberrations or anything strange going on uh, in that one second increment that we just looked at up here. Okay. And then there was separately something going on with like a media conversion service. So conversion service, and this thing would basically take every one second increment and then it would break it into frames. So, you know, usually it's 24 FPS on any stream that you watch, like any TV channel. So what they would, for FPS is frames per second, by the way. So for one second, there's 24 images that you can extract out of that one second. So that's 24 images that would, it would need to break apart, would also break apart the audio buffers into smaller, more manageable chunks. And then it would store all of that into S3. Okay, so it would store all that broken apart stuff into S3, and then the detectors would read off that. So detector one will go grab that data, detector two will go grab that data, and then, so these are two reads, right? Read one, read one, and read two, read two. Um, so they would read off that data, and then the result aggregator here at the bottom would write to this data, it would write to S3, rather. Okay, so this is what they did. And at first glance, like this isn't that bad, right? Like this, this kind of makes sense, but it kind of is bad. And the reason it's bad is because step functions are hella expensive. Uh, I can't remember the cost off the top of my head, but it's like 0. 0.000025 per state transition, state transition. That's the key. Every one of these things, Actually, let me get a different color here so I don't confuse you. Let's say green. Okay, every one of these is a state transition. That's a state transition. That's a state transition. This is a state transition, state transition. So for every single one of these, uh, every step function invocation, that's like four state transitions that are occurring here. And for every single second and for every single stream, so 100 plus channels, Every second, there's a hundred step functions being launched, four different possible state tra transitions that are occurring. That can get extremely out of control. Not only that, but there's a lot of S3 reads and writes that are passing along. So I did the math on this, and based on that 100 stream assumption and four state transitions, and uh, one second per the one second that we're extracting per stream, it comes out to around $4,000, $4,000, USD per month. And this is just for the step function, not for the lambdas, not for S3. So they were probably spending a really big amount uh, just to run this thing. And 
you can extrapolate this, uh, like maybe they have more channels at this point, I don't know, but this is for approximately 100 channels. And so this is kind of what they um, were, were trying, right? And initially this worked pretty well, but as you can imagine, you very quickly run into some scaling bottlenecks with this. There's only so many state transitions that you're allowed per second with step functions. There's only so many concurrent executions that you are allowed with step functions as well. So this ended up getting really, really expensive. Now, now, one thing that bothered me with this article is if you use the default step functions and you can go watch my video on step functions, um, I'll, I'll link it below, step functions versus express step functions. There's two different types. There's the normal step functions, which you're paying for every state transition. And then there's what's called the express step functions. That was launched, I wanna say about a year, maybe two years ago. And express step functions, you don't pay for the state transitions. Like you don't pay for this, you don't pay for that, you don't pay for this, you don't pay for that. All you pay for is the amount of memory that you need and the duration of this whole run. So I'm not sure what was going on, like why they just, just didn't decide to use that feature. Maybe it wasn't launched when they made this thing, but if they just use that approach, like this thing could have been dropped to potentially like just a couple hundred dollars a month. Who am I to say, but you know, that's what I probably would have tried if I was on that team. But anyways, that's kind of what went down. All right, so that is basically their first approach and everyone was like freaking out about this, obviously like, oh, look, set function sucks, serverless sucks, blah, 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 blah. And so let's talk about now how they fix this problem because obviously you can't keep this up, like $4,000 a month just for step functions is a lot. And I think they even said like they were only able to hit like 5% of their concurrency or what they originally wanted. So like it just wasn't scaling with what they needed for this tool to do. By the way, I wanna stress this as well. They say this in the article too. It's a, it was a tool, a tool that they built that's using this. It wasn't like a well-designed system that was meant to scale to hundreds of different channels. When you build something that's just like meant to be a small ad hoc tool for debugging, that's got a very different architecture than if you were to build something to scale for like a real production use case that needs to handle many thousands, millions, hundreds of thousands of channels. So that's one thing that, you know, I'll get to that in the final section of the video, but uh, just a little bit of a sneak peek. All right, so that's kind of what they did. Hopefully that makes sense. And by the way, one small thing as well. Sorry, I keep on coming back. Um, this part two, the detectors that they have in here, they, they say in the diagram that these were independent step functions as well. I wrote them as detectors, but they have that in a diagram on the article. Maybe I can show it to you here, actually. Let me just show you. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay, so here it is. So this is basically what I drew out for you. And you can see here within the, this is the main workflow that we just kind of drew right now. Within the um, parallel executions, this is also a step function. And so is this one. So for every detector that they had, they had a separate step function. So there could have been even more state transitions within each detector. So this $4,000 a month estimate is probably like very undershot. It was probably costing them like a lot more and they don't give you enough details in the article to actually figure that out. All right, last little, little blab. So now let's talk about kind of what they did to address this, right? So uh, re-architecture. So shortly after they figured out this thing costs too much money, they decided let's build this thing the right way. Okay, very simple solution, very, very simple. And it was actually pretty well designed too. So what they decided to do is they have many, many detectors, right? Detectors. And let's say like one, two, I don't know, five different detectors and they can constantly add more detectors and they probably will, right? Like there's more methods that you want to use, more um, things that you want to analyze, more algorithms that are coming out. So this can like go up to N or whatever number, right? So th it needs to scale based on the number of detectors. And what they decided to do is like pull all the logic out. So all the serverless crap, they basically threw it all away and said, let's do all of this in memory. And so instead of having it run in a way where, you know, you're using step functions to orchestrate everything and storing all that data in S3, let's just keep it all in memory. So that's essentially what they did. And so they, they used ECS and they have an ECS cluster set up and what they did. And so there were four different things that they did in this ECS task. Uh, this is an ECS task. Okay. So the first thing that they would do is that they, they would convert the chunk, convert the chunk, the one second into those 24 frames, right? Convert chunk. They would do this all within ECS now, not using a serverless workflow. The second thing that they did is that they would run the detector, run detector. 
detector. And doing this locally now means that, um, and converting the chunks on the actual task itself means you don't have to go and grab this information in S3 anymore. It's all happening in memory and storing everything in memory and running locally. So no more Lambda functions or anything like that. And then the third thing that they did was they aggregated the results from running the detector. So aggregate, aggregate results, and then save save the final information. And then that would go to S3, right? And so this was the very basic approach that they took. And so you may be asking yourself, like, how did they scale with the number of detectors? Like as the number of detectors grow, like how did this work? And they used a very simple horizontal scaling technique, which is they created multiple different tasks for multiple different detectors. So they basically replicated everything that we have from above and said this task, you know, task one, whatever this is, this is responsible for detector one, so D1 and D2. And on task one, it would just be responsible for that. So they parameterized, they parameterized, parameter, did I spell that right? I'm not sure. Anyways, they parameterized that and then they had multiple other detectors that they would put in task two. So they would say D3, D4. And basically for every new detector that they wanted to add, they would just add a separate task for each one. And this can basically scale to the moon because you're uh, scaling horizontally. Uh, this actually actually be five, five and six. And so this is how they achieved their solution, right? So now you don't have to worry about any of the costs that are associated with step functions. Um, for S3, you don't have to worry about those uh, intermediary calls just to grab the, the, um, the chunk data. It's all happening on disk. It's all happening in memory. So it's, it's being stored locally. Uh, so no more kind of grabbing that and waiting for that over the wire or data transfer costs as well. Um, and so this is what they did. And it turns out that they saved like 90% of the costs. And herein lies kind of why the internet got, got pissed off. Because everyone is saying now, hey guys, look, I told you serverless sucks, monoliths are the way to go and you should never use serverless. And what ticks me off about that argument is that, is this a monolith? Is this a monolith? Like. This is not a monolith. Uh, like, okay, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe. I don't think I'm wrong on this one. This is like a tiny little microservice that just does a simple job. When I think of a monolith, I think of like this big, like kind of bulky guy that like, you know, has like SQS processors. Maybe it's got an API or two, like two APIs. Maybe it's got like a local and memory cache. You know, it's like serving multiple use cases, like maybe another SQS, uh, maybe it's the authority on some data model. Like this is what I think of a classic monolith. And I just don't see it. I don't see how this thing that they built is being considered a monolith. So that's my first problem. Like the whole monolith versus serverless argument, I don't buy it, okay? And the second thing that maybe why the internet is pissed off, but this is just like a personal opinion of mine is I actually think what they did kind of made sense, at least in the beginning. Like this approach, what we have here is actually like pretty good, right? It's reliable. Like, you know, sure, there's a lot of costs that you need to worry about, but you remember, in the document, in the, the article itself, they said that this thing was just a tool. This is just a tool that they built, that they used. Um, they didn't say time to time, but it's a tool that existed, not meant for the scale that it was originally being attempted to use for. So as a tool, like a diagnostic tool, this is a really great thing. And usually when you're building tools like this, like you're not necessarily thinking about like, oh, is this thing going to scale to the moon? Like it's a diagnostic tool for heaven's sake. So like, why are you worrying about that? You know, if this was just run on one channel for like 20 minutes just to figure something out, then who cares? Like it's going to cost you nothing. Obviously, it's not going to work when you want to scale it up to hundreds, thousands of channels. But, you know, who am I to say um, so that's like one problem. Like, so I think they did the right thing here. Start small, POC something, use it, see if it works. If it doesn't, iterate. And that's basically how the development cycle is supposed to work in the first place. They learned from the failures here and they built something that, you know, it's not, I wouldn't probably do it this way, but it kind of makes sense and it works for what they were trying to do. Um, so the internet's pissed off about this and 
I don't think it's got any basis to it. And the way I read into this is they did all the right things. They learned from their mistakes. They designed something that's scalable uh, and it's going to work. And, you know, what's wrong with that? So hopefully you enjoyed this video and learned a little bit about kind of why the fuss is running amok on the Internet these days. But, you know, it's all for nothing. Serverless monolith. Just pick the right tool for the job. All right. So thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.